On this video, finally, the monster game Too Many Bones gets subjugated to my review verdict. This is raved about by solo gamers everywhere. The question is, for the money you pay and the size of this game, is it worth it? Let's find out. Hello and welcome to The Broken Meeple. If this is your first time checking out the channel, be sure to check out the rest of my content to find out about reviews, top 10, solo plays, you name it, I've done it. See if anything takes your fancy, and if I've earned your subscription, consider doing so. And if any of the games on my channel that I talk about take your fancy, then consider acquiring them from zatu.co.uk, where you can use my code TBMEEPLE5 in the bottom corner to get 5% discount on your entire basket purchase. If there's a gap on your shelf that needs filling, consider using the code and fill it up quick. Too Many Bones is at its core a dice builder RPG game. The idea is, is that you take control of a gear lock, i.e. your character, who has several dice attributable to him. Dice are somewhat on the uh, plentiful side, we'll get more on that later. But with these dice you will customise your character in various ways by unlocking skills and levelling up stats. Throughout this adventure you will have several little encounters represented by a deck of cards. Each encounter requires you to either choose a story option or to fight it out on a little battle map, this 4x4 grid, with these poker chips that represent your character and hit points and enemies, and as you go through all these different fights you'll level up, gain more dice, unlock more skills, until eventually you come across the big bad guy at the end of the whole adventure, take him out and you win. The dice in this game represent your various skills and stats. When you are deciding whether you want to move, attack or defend, you essentially roll these basic dice to represent how much you've got that you can store up for the round or use immediately. But your basic skill dice and your advanced skill dice are essentially custom dice which you roll and see if you can trigger the various abilities. Each face of the die, all of them d6s, essentially allow you to perform certain abilities and effects. The higher you roll, effectively, the stronger the ability is. And then the meat of the game is essentially how you use these dice to your best advantage during a fight. Do you try and opt for more defense or more attack? Do you use this particular skill now or wait till later in the combat before you decide to trigger it? If you've got a poison arrow somewhere, then maybe you want that poison arrow for the big troll later, or maybe you just want to use it now just so you can get another attack off. It's decisions like these, along with the movement of your characters, that take precedence during a battle map scenario. The other scenarios are essentially just pick a choice 50-50 out of a story option, or possibly roll some dice to see what the result is, and then you just get rewards based on those encounters. The deck of cards for encounters themselves is pre-built at the start of an adventure, depending on which of the big baddies you're going up against. The big baddie will also determine what type of monsters you can fight. It could be tons of orcs in one adventure, but then in another it might be a bunch of wolves and wargs. You know, if you've ever watched Lord of the Rings, you know what those are. And with this, you can basically customise the adventure and your character in multiple ways. As I said, it is an RPG game, although more on that later. Essentially, the RPG just mainly represents the fact that it's your character that you can customise how you see fit. So the premise itself is pretty simple, but the concepts in this game are a little bit more complex to talk about. So let's quick start with duration, how long is the game and does it warrant its time? Well, this one is kind of relative, because with the duration, each individual encounter can be anywhere from 2 minutes to 20 minutes, possibly even longer. The thing is, is that it depends what encounter you get. An individual encounter, which is just a story option, can literally result like that, and it's done and dusted. Whereas a battle map encounter will typically take a solo player maybe between 15 to 30 minutes to finish an encounter. If you add more players, then there's more thinking, discussion time, and it can go on longer. But the actual adventure itself is going to take you several hours to get through the whole thing, but you can basically save at any time. In between encounters, you simply just go, right, well, we've got our dice, so I know what I have, I know what I've unlocked, leave the game out and play it again later, or you could just take a note of what you've got, pack it away, and you're good. It's easy to resume this game at a later date, and you don't have to go through a long scenario in one go, which is good, because some of the basic scenarios you could do in a game night, but some of the longer ones, especially with more players, you'd be like, mm, maybe we might want to cut this up into pieces and do it sort of piecemeal. We get on to ease of play, and this is one of the biggest negatives this game has. The ease of play... The, I think the word ease is the wrong word to use. I think it's more the gargantuan steep vertical cliff of play of this one. 
Wow! This one expects a lot of you in terms of learning the game. The rulebook itself is not exactly particularly large or thick, so you would imagine, okay, there's only so much I need to learn. Uh, yeah, um, slight issue with that. The rulebook is not immensely huge, but there's quite a fair amount of text in here. This is quite a text-heavy rulebook with not a lot of pictorial examples. It does have a, shall we say, game example in the back for that, but even that, Live Battle is about four or five pages long with basically a wall of text. Where are the picture examples? That is what you need in a game like this. But on top of that, Wow, I have never had to look up Board Game Geek more often in my life when I have played any game whatsoever. And I've played a bunch of Portal games. We know how their rule books are usually, but I've had to ask so many questions as to, so how does this work in this situation? How does that work with this? This doesn't quite make sense. I don't get it. Whatever, and if you go on Board Game Geek, the FAQs are extensive. They've got an FAQ, I think, in the... Have they got one in the back of this book? I'm not into... Oh, yeah, yeah, a few technical questions, but believe me, you're going to be asking a lot more. Now, the basic concepts of the game are not necessarily complex in themselves, but the rulebook doesn't do an adequate job of explaining them with, you know, any sense of real coherency. But you, you can kind of get a basic feel of how you should play it, and you certainly do need to study this thing you know, like it's an exam in order to be able to play it normally. But, and it's, it's kind of like, you'll learn the rule book, you'll get going, but at some point you're gonna ask a question. And it's up to you to decide whether you just house rule it, make a decision at the time, or go on Board Game Geek to find the answer because you'll be hard pressed to find it in here. And if you do find it in here, then well, well done because the index is only so good. And even then, because it's mostly a wall of text, it's not easy to search for a single piece of information. This one certainly doesn't score highly for the rulebook in that. And even when you get past that aspect... Oh my god! <laughs> wow! Every single character... I mean, this is Nugget. This is an expansion gear lock. Every character has one of these. It is a reference sheet with every single die on it, every single face, what all the abilities do, every single bit of iconography that the character uses, as well as some basic stuff like terminology, like placing in various slots. Everything's all about putting dice into slots, unlocking them, unlocking them. But, and then on the back, you've got some critical details of how to play your character, a backup plan, which is kind of like a, a consolation thing you can do with rubbish dice rolls, uh, a beginner build strategy, uh, some skills you should go for, a couple of extra bonuses you can get, and oh my god, these things are extensive. Now, they are good, apart from the fact that you are going to have to FAQ a few things every now and again, much like the normal rule book. but I, I will admit, there's a lot of information condensed onto this sheet. But if I was to like show you this game and say, do you fancy playing a bit of Too Many Bones? It's like, oh cool, yeah, I'll take this character, Nugget. What do I do with her? If that person is still sitting at the table when you hand them this sheet, they are committed. <laughs> Very committed. Because I looked at these and I nearly burst a blood vessel trying to think, how am I supposed to absorb all this? And during your first few games, you are certainly going to be looking at this sheet a lot. I mean, you won't necessarily need to look at every bit of the sheet, because depending on what you decide to go down your path of character creation, like, you know, maybe I'm going to focus more on the red dice, uh, or in this case, uh, gifted dice. Fine, I only really need to read the gifted dice abilities, I don't need to read the rest. But you've got all these things down the side, like all of these different, like, skills and iconography, and it's just a lot to absorb. This is a big rules dump, a big investment, you will eventually reach like the end of the tunnel. The light at the end of the tunnel is there, but it's a long walk to it. And even fans of this game, like the big diehard fans that you see on Facebook raving about this game, can't defend the fact that this is not a pick up and play game in any way, shape or form. It does its best to give you all the rules you need to know, but you're still gonna have to put in the time and put in the effort. So on to tactics and strategy. How do those battle map games function? You know, is the customizing of your character really cool? Well, hmm, yeah. Uh, I'm kind of in the minority on this one, I must admit, online, although there are some people that do agree with me here. The biggest problem I have with these battle maps is the grid is too small. It's a four by four grid, but when you start the map, 
you have so many enemies based on your player count and how well into the quest you're doing, but it's not uncommon for you to have at least four enemies on the map. You can only have four enemies on the map at any one time, the rest go into stacks and come out later. But typically, having four people on the map is not an unusual circumstance, right? And that's four enemies. You might have two or three gear locks playing, even if you're playing solo, I will, I will control two gear locks at a time. But you have four by four grit. The back spaces, the back four on each side, are only for ranged characters or I think melee characters. I think melee can go there, I'm not sure. But essentially, ranged characters start at the back. The melee characters start in the two in the middle. Four, four. Every enemy can move at least two spaces. Depends on the enemy, but typically they move two spaces. You move based on how much dexterity dice you want to spend actually moving. So the higher your dex, the more you can do in a round. Dex is like one of the most important skills. Do not underestimate it. Although to be fair, all the skills are pretty important. But the problem is with this map is that every match starts effectively like a rugby scrum. You know that whole thing in, um, I'm talking about English rugby here, okay guys, if you're in America, but you know when like they start on the line and then like, it's like this and then the, well, actually a bit like an NFL match actually. You know, the ball starts on the line and they sort of go, go, boosh, and then everybody just collides into this massive cluster of everyone basically beating the living snot out of each other. That's what this game feels like from a movement perspective. Movement just doesn't seem to be a big factor here. And there's a few fans of Too Many Bones that will have my head off for saying that because they will defend it to the hilt that movement is incredibly tactical and incredibly rich. Occasionally, and I mean occasionally, you will get occasions where uh, an actual bit of movement works. You know, oh, this actually, you know, this moving into there could actually save them an attack or moving into there might just delay it for one turn. But a lot of the time, you are surrounded by enemies. You don't want your range guy getting in there because they'll just get pummeled to a pulp. So your range guy just sits at the back sort of shooting off arrows or whatever they've got against the other range characters because their range characters are basically targeting your range characters. So it's just basically a massive arrow fight. But then your melee ones are just stuck in the middle, might as well beating each other out. So you're either tanking the damage or you're dishing it out. So glass cannon or big tank, and certainly the I forget his name, but the I forget his name, but the gearlock who basically has a shield and you know a sword and is just the, the tank of the group, easily my favourite character in the whole game because if you kit him up right, he's basically naturally unkillable for a while, and so he's able to really win those war of attrition. But my, what what is the point of the map if movement sucks? Because everything can move too. So unless you spend pretty much your entire turn going from one end of the map to the very other end of the map, chances are each enemy can catch you up. And the targeting priority does have them sort of go, right, I'll go for the weakest or the strongest or the ranged or the melee. But if they're not within range, then they'll simply just go for the other closest target and you just can't really escape anything. So what's the point of moving around this 4x4 four four grid? Every map, or by 90% of the matches I've played feel like they just played out the same. I see what enemies they are, I decide, right, my target priority is probably that one followed by that one followed by that one followed by that one. Okay, cool. Range, you stand in the back corner and just shoot all day. Do I need to move? No, nope, no, nope, you just stand back there. It's all well and good. What are you going to do? Well, I'll just stand here and poof, and everything just comes at you and tries to kill you. Where's the tactics in the movement? I don't get it. But... Deciding who you want to go after, how to use your abilities, how to use your dice to their best, you know, best effect. Those choices are really good. I like the way that you can customize your character in lots of different ways. More on that a bit later. But when you've got the dice handy, when you've got so many dexterity dice and you've got to think, right, I've got a good attack, got a good defense. If I lock that now, keep it till later. I could use it later when I really need that defense. But let's roll. Ooh, I've got my bomb. I can use this bomb in this turn. Anybody I could go up against? Well, yeah, if you throw it over there, that'll do some damage. Then I'll tank the next guy. And you do make a lot of these cool tactical decisions with the dice. Not necessarily with your movement, but with your abilities and your stats. That's where a lot of the tactics and strategy come in. The encounters where you, you know, you just go through a basic like 50-50 plot element is not exactly much in the way of tactics and strategy. You basically just pick an option and resolve it. Okay, what we do? They're not exactly that interesting. But the game itself, whew, um, I mentioned it was already quite hard to play from a complexity perspective. This game is one of the hardest games I have ever played in my entire life. This is hard. It is a dice game at the end of the day. So bear in mind, you're going to be rolling dice and they could hose you. But the enemies are super strong. 
There are no weaklings in this game here. You've only got so many rounds to actually finish the match before everybody starts ticking down on health. Your health, even if you upgrade it, is very limited and can easily just be chunk, taken down in a chunk. You can even start certain battle maps where based on the initiative order, which is random, so occasionally you'll start at the top and occasionally right at the bottom, the initiative order could be done in such a way that you actually die before you get a turn. Just give us a turn, you son of a there are, it can get stupidly hard. Some of those ability dice, which are really cool, have misses on them. Now, you get some consolation prize for the misses, but it's not that particularly great unless you've missed with a ton of dice. But I don't like the idea that I paid month experience and time to get this really cool ability with my guy where he can do like a double slash with his sword and take out lots of enemies, and yet there's a one in three chance the dice doesn't work. And when your dice are used, if they're not basic dice, they go out of the game. So you only get to use your abilities a certain amount of times, like once usually, each round. There are exceptions to the rules. Some dice will stick around or come back. But most of the time it's like, like I mean, there's one guy, um, I think it's another expansion. Uh, I forget I forget what it's called. Where is he? I can't remember. He's like a Beastmaster character. He's a Gilly. Gilly, right? Can control beasts, can summon beasts. That sounds really cool. But then you roll the beast die, it misses, and then that's it. So I've just paid experience for that, and based on an unlucky die roll, I don't get my beast. So his ability is rubbish, and I've just wasted a turn doing that. Why? At least let the beast come out and just let it be slightly underpowered, but to have it not work at all? That's a bit harsh. You know, some people want that challenge and all fair to them, but I like a challenge to be fair. This just feels like the game is literally punching you in the face over and over again. And then on top of that, the dice gods are essentially going, I feel a bit sorry for this guy, you know, do you reckon we should give him a chance? Nah, ones, misses, one. It's, oh, I mean, yeah. It can get frustrating, but if you want a challenge, if you really want a game to test your skill, then fair enough. I'm not saying I'm a very skillful player at this game. I mean, I... I wholeheartedly, hand on heart, say I'm probably a bad player at this game, but still, I shouldn't have to play it a million times to get amazingly good at it before the challenge seems fair. So A for aesthetics, does the game look good, is it well produced? Well, this is where the highest, well actually no, i say the second highest uh, plus point of this game is. This is a very well produced game. You are paying the ends of the earth for this game. It is one of the most expensive games you will find at a convention but you are getting your money's worth in terms of the majority of the components. The only weak link with the components is some of those poker chips. Some of the poker chips for the enemies and your characters are really good, really chunky, glossy, love them. But you've got these very basic red hit point, like hit point counters, which are like the, imagine if you bought like the cheap five pound poker set at Asda or Walmart, and you got that poker set. You know, these are like flimsy, you know, little red chips. They are pretty horrible, but at the end of the day, they're just tracking hit points. So I guess if they made them really good, and I think they did in an upgrade pack, but if you're talking a retail version of the game, they're not very good, but at the end of the day, they're hit points. What, you know, what does it matter? But the rest of it, big bucks, you're getting a lot. This is a typical box of dice, and each tray has got all its dice in here. This is just, I think it's two characters worth of dice in here, right? Two characters you can get in each there. So all of that blue stuff, is one character and the gray is another, I forget which is which, but you get these trays and all of these are custom. And some people have harpered, oh, the artwork on these dice is not particularly good. I think it's pretty decent for what you need. It's a die, it doesn't have to be the best artwork in the ever, ever on a die, but all the symbols are clearly distinguishable. They, you know, they are easily said, they are customized, they've got numbers on them, so they reference your reference sheet with the number. They've got all sorts of different symbols and iconography on here. The numbers are clear to see. It's not difficult to read them. They're multiple colors. I think the dice are fantastic. If you're going to make a game about a dice builder RPG and at least give you good dice, well, they do that. It's really good. Oh, yeah, did I mention the mats? The mats for your gear locks. These are neoprene mats. So, yeah, I mean, you know me. I've got, like, a whole collection of them down there. I love neoprene mats. And these are no exception. They've got cutout holes where you slot your die in so they don't shift around. Although it shouldn't shift around. It's a neoprene mat on your table. They should stay pretty sturdy. But it's very satisfying to sort of just slot the dice into the various places because it's just snug. Very snug. It doesn't feel loose doesn't feel too tight it sits in nice and sort of cushioned snug like being wrapped up in a blanket and 
it just is a very satisfying thing. Eye for immersion is the theme strong. Do you really get into the adventure? I'm sorry to say you don't. Now you do get into your characters, and this kind of will link with the next topic. Your characters feel very, very different. If you're playing the tank character, you are fundamentally different from the bomber thrower character. You're fundamentally different from the beast master. You know, all the characters feel very distinct. And in terms of immersion, you get into playing your character. Not quite in an RPG setting. I think RPG is a little bit on the uh, somewhat uh, exaggerated line for a definition. But certainly, you feel like your character more than in a lot of other games. If I'm playing one, it's definitely a different experience. The story, however, is a big problem here. Because I was expecting like an engaging story to come from this. And there really isn't. The encounters are super basic. It's literally just, oh, you walk through, it, it's basically a bunch of cards, like in Near and Far, right? So if you play Near and Far, you get a bunch of these like random scenarios that you might get in the, uh, what do they call it, the arcade mode, where you just have a uh, card with a 50-50 choice of what to do. And sometimes you get that here. It's like, what kind of uh, encounter do I want to do? Do I want to ambush them or do I want to charge them right now? Here's the difficulty, set up your map. But it's basically just like playing near and far arcade mode. There's not really much of a coherent story here at all. The main story is that you're going after this big bad guy. What did the big bad guy do? Don't know, really, we're just going after him. Who are we? I don't know, we're just adventurers, let's go after him. And then the story starts off the same every time where you've got this introduction mission of like, you walk out the castle and people try to kill you. It's the introduction mission. But then after the first couple, two or three missions, then the deck becomes randomized. And there's a fair amount of cards but none of the encounters are that particularly interesting and they're very disjointed. One minute I'm chasing a bunch of orcs into an ambush, and the next minute I'm in a merchant store trying to buy some supplies, the next I'm like, like getting attacked by wolves in my sleep. It's just like, okay, well, where's the actual plot here? There isn't one. You just go through this deck of cards one by one, doing the various scenarios until eventually you go, oh, hi, big bad, how's it going? Oh yeah, we're supposed to kill each other. Right, okay, start the fight. I never felt like there was a plot here. And finally, L for longevity, is there enough variety in this game to keep it fresh each time? I will concede. As much as I have given this game a bit of flack, and from my perspective it kind of deserves it, this is definitely probably the best thing about this game. I cannot talk enough praise about the longevity of this. There is so much customization, even in just the base game, for this. Let alone if you have bought the Undertow expansion, which I think is a standalone one, or any of the extra gear locks. This has got the four original gear locks plus two gear locks I bought on the side, and I think there's another four to six of them that you can buy on the side in sort of increasing levels of complexity with very different rules. But the amount of customization you can do in this game on these gear locks is unprecedented in a lot of games. Just because I take the, let's for example take the, the healer. I uh, forget the name, but I take the healer. So, okay, so one aspect of the dice. In fact, let me show you the... Nah, that's a better idea. Let me show you Nugget here, right? I mentioned that they've got all these different dice. So you can see the red, purple, orange, blue, yellow, right? That's all the different dice that they could take. But you, even if you do a long adventure, you will not be able to unlock every single ability on here. It just won't happen. Because as well as these abilities, you need to level up your stats. Hit points, attack defense and dexterity, all of which are important, especially dexterity. And I suppose hit points, really, you need to stay alive. But with this, you've got so many different paths you can take with your character. So, you know, one down here, gifted. So you, you're able to find items and stuff really quickly. Okay, cool. Instead, I might decide to go for a propeller. So I get a bolo dagger and a long blade to basically attack enemies with. Okay, so I'm more of a combat -y character, all right? So what if I try the sword dancer? Okay, so I can do dashes, tumbles, side steps, and things like that. Okay, so I'm more of a, uh, like, you know, like a regular duelist, you know, okay, fair enough. And then you've got locksmith, key masters. Okay, so I can unlock treasure chests. There's a lot of customization, and that's just for this character. You take uh, the tank character, you could be the quintessential tank shield, nothing can hurt me. But there's other ways you can take that one. The healer can do really good healing, but then they could be in into poisons. So rather than healing the party, it's more, well, when you get this big troll turn up with a mass ton of defense, then I can shoot a poison at, uh, you know, throw a poison vial at him, and then it takes off his health. There's 
so much customization. If you play a short adventure, you'll barely be able to unlock much, and that is a bit of a problem. You kind of have to really focus on a small adventure, which is why most players tend to play the long adventures over time, because then you get to unlock more stuff and try more stuff. If only the replay value was there in terms of the big bads and the encounter cards themselves. The encounter cards will quickly get repetitive and you're not immersed in them anyway. The big bads are basically just another combat that happens, but they're unique in the terms of how the combat takes place. So you'll probably cherry pick your favorites. And certainly I prefer the ones that take longer rather than shorter, because I like to have my character really develop over time, especially when you can just simply play a few scenarios, save it, leave it on the table, and then come back to it later. So my final word on Too Many Bones is a hard one. There's some extremes, both good and bad. On the plus side, this has such wonderful variety of customization. It has such good production values, and you can customize the duration to your heart's content. But then on the other extreme, you've got to put up with the fact that you're not immersed in any kind of story whatsoever. The movement tactical nature of this game is somewhat lost in a rugby scrum style move. And I granted, some people will disagree with this. And so I urge you to get multiple opinions on this before making a purchasing decision. But for me, I just didn't find movement to be that interesting. But the worst thing is just how hard it is to get into this game from a rules perspective and how often I have to keep checking the rule book, checking a reference sheet and checking Board Game Geek for FAQs. It, I don't mind doing that occasionally in a game, but to do it every single time I play, it quickly gets very, very frustrating. And I don't want a solo game that's already going to be like, right, here's this big box junk find my character, do all this, set all this up, right? And then get going, only to then have to go, oh, hang on a minute, how's this rule work? Hang on, let me check, let me check. All right, I think I'm good, all right? And then about an hour or so later, oh, I rolled the ability and I didn't even get it. You know, there's a lot of frustration here. Extreme bads, extreme goods. So how do I rank this? Overall though, I've been teetering between a five and a six, and I think I'm probably gonna be a tiny bit generous and I think I do love the way you can customize the gear locks. I do like how you can do all these cool choices with the dice. It is well produced. I think it deserves a 6 out of 10 overall. It's a decent game. It's above average. On my scale, 6 is an above average game. I don't think it's bad. I just think there are certain elements of this that seriously need some improvement or a big revision of, you know, like get Paul Grogan to do your rule book perhaps or something like that or really like condense all this FAQ you've got into one big compendium rule book that's easy to follow and then maybe it will be a little less frustrating but I can't I can't bump it up to a seven with the amount of frustration that I do get with this game despite the positives that I do have to say about it so with you I think it's going to be a case of is it worth the cash do you think that the ease of play issues or like having to get through this rule book and then ask a bunch of FAQ questions are going to put you off? Are you like really interested in the variety and the customization? Do you even agree with me about the movement aspect? I know some of you do. I know some of you don't. So you've got to factor this in. And I do recommend checking out some other content creators who have talked about this game to kind of make up your mind because there's a lot of people who have really dug into this game a lot more than even I have. You know, I've played this a fair chunk since I got it, but there are people out there who play this as their, like, religiously as their main solo game, and I urge you to check out their reviews as well. Now, I hope you've enjoyed my content on The Broken Meeple, but I'm not the only person producing videos out there for reviews, top tens, and solo plays. There's loads of people out there that deserve your support, and I'm not talking about the big lot there. I'm talking about the smaller creators who are just passionate about games and want you to check them out. So why don't you start with this channel? Howdy everybody, I am The Brant. And I am Larry. <laughs> and welcome to our YouTube channel, Step Into The Portal. This is a channel brought to you by a store which is located in Manchester, Connecticut called The Portal. It is, and we started this channel um, partly because of COVID. I mean, people aren't able to come to the store and build a community and play new games. So we're trying to bring new games to people in the community and elsewhere to see what's out there, what people might be interested in. Um, you yeah. know, that's how we started. Yeah, so check out our channel. We got live plays most often. We've got unboxings, and eventually we'll have reviews of various games on the channel. Where we'll probably have some differing opinions. There you go, differing opinions too. So thanks so much for watching, and we hope that you step into the portal. <laughs> Bye. Take care. 
So that's it for me on this review for Too Many Bones. If you like what you see and I've earned your subscription, please click the avatar in the center of the screen to subscribe and hit the bell to actually be notified about future content. Until next time, you can check out my recent guide on Pursuit of Happiness with the recent Kickstarter that has opened, or just check out the most recent upload on my channel. Until next time, remember, it's only a game.